about some advancements in innovative contracting and specifically um, uh, presenting data from both payers and the industry perspective around uh, what's working and not working with value-based contracts. Um, the goal of, the, of the, the survey work was really to understand where there's alignment um, between the two parties so that you can build upon that, but also to understand where there's areas kind of of disconnect um, so you can address those. Um, so we'll be presenting that data. Um, this is work that was done um, at, out of the a National Association of Managed Care Physicians and their Value-Based Care Council um, and was conducted by uh, Real Endpoints, uh, a company I uh, work with. Um, we'll also be talking about um, some research that was done out of the Tufts New Digs group that was more specific to gene therapies, gene cell and gene therapies, um, which actually does um, sort of amplify, um, you know, similar uh, findings. So, you know, I think some of the key takeaways um, are that you know, there are areas of alignment and really key areas of alignment around, are around structuring contracts with outcomes that are easy to measure and with a low administrative burden so that they can be done more easily and implemented more easily. Um, but if you take that sort of a layer deeper, um, both payers and industry said that having organizational commitment behind this was key to moving forward. And, you know, I think that that kind of is, um, you know, it makes sense, but I, I think oftentimes we forget about that is, you know, if one party in an organization is interested in pursuing something, but overall the organization isn't, you know, things tend to wither, right, over time. Um, and so, you know, it's um, a, you know, I think a message around um, people understanding across the organization, buying into the concept, um, you know, as part of, you know, the go forward strategy around that. The other thing that I thought was really super interesting about um, what we found is that both uh, payers and manufacturers were interested in focusing these kind of innovative value-based contracts in um, the same areas. And it was around specialty medications for broader populations. Um, and we don't often think about that. So for things like diet, especially medications for diabetes, which is increasingly emerging, um, um, oncology, um, as, as well as cardiovascular disease. And the other area of interest was cell and gene therapies. So um, it gives some you know, common ground about where to approach and then how to think about how you approach the, the type of contract itself. say it's a mix. So definitely we're seeing more um, publicly available um, information about these sorts of contracts. Um, I, I think that the warranty models that Pfizer and Bayer announced um, that were really between man the manufacturer and more so the patient than the payer um, was a, you know, a great example of that. Bluebird Bio has, um, you know, come out with a value-based contract for Zenteglo. So we're seeing more of it. I think there's a lot more discussion. But when we ask the payers um, whether they're implementing more and the manufacturers whether they're implementing more, um, there's still a lot of ground um, to cover. And, you know, I think of the folks we asked, uh, only about a third had actually implemented a, a contract, which, you know, is uh, undoubtedly going to be a gr higher number than it was two, three, four, five years ago, but it's still um, not anywhere near, a, you know, the industry standard or a tipping point. Well, I think 
it makes it challenging for some drugs to engage in a value-based contract. And, you know, I, I know there's a lot of discussion around uh, whether we really should be focusing these on true outcomes measures, which as you say, can take years to actually materialize or whether we should be focusing more, um, you know, uh, on process measures and whether that kind of misses the point. And there's a lot of debate about that, but here's my take on it is, you know, if someone, for example, starts a chronic medication and stops after two or three months, uh, they're not getting a benefit of that chronic medication. And the that use that they had is really kind of waste in the system. Um, so, you know, you can do uh, a, um, a value-based contract with an outcome measure that's around that discontinuation early um, with the idea that, you know, th there's a lot of reasons why it didn't work. Um, it could be that the patient couldn't tolerate it. It could be the patient couldn't afford it. You know, it could be that the doctor found a better option for that patient and they decided that that, that would be a better treatment to move to. But regardless, it's waste in the system because the patient didn't get a, a benefit from it, right? It's not necessarily anybody's fault, but, you know, ideally if, you know, a drug is going to benefit a patient, they'd be started on it and they continue on it. So, you know, it's, um, you know, some will argue that's not really an outcome measure. Well, it, it's not necessarily a clinical hard outcome for that drug, but it certainly is an outcome for that patient in terms of the value that's received. And it's an outcome for the system, right, in terms of, of value. So, uh, you know, as people take a broader view around um, value and outcome, I, I think that it, it helps to make these more successful. And that's where you start. Right. And then, you know, we can get more sophisticated with longer term measures that are more complicated to measure and over time. But, you know, let's start somewhere and, you know, walk before we run. There's a, a lot of opportunity for those treatments to participate in a value based contract. Um, because, you, the, you know, while the studies have been done, you know, we don't necessarily know how these will perform in the real world. And, you know, there's a lot of choice patients have at, around, you know, treatments. And, you know, payers are going to really have to weigh as well, you know, if, uh, how, what they make available to who and when. Right. And so from a market access standpoint, you know, if I was one of these companies, I would ha have a value based contract to sort of neutralize some of those concerns payers would have and then let the providers work with the patients around making the choice for them personally. And so if you de-risk um, in a way. Um, the high upfront cost of the gene therapy um, and the uncertainty around its it, you know, performance for that individual and um, its durability over time um, through a value-based contract, then you know, the payer can say, you know, it doesn't matter to me which one you choose, um, provider, choose the right one for that patient. And, you know, the, the patient gets the appropriate therapy for them. So I think it's a prime candidate for this. And, um, you know, we'll see how that, you know, plays out in the marketplace.